my name is Brooke Basinger. I'm the technical lead of a medical device project at Verily Life Sciences. And you might wonder why I'm starting off my talk that sounds like it should be about medical devices with a picture of a roller coaster. And it's because I've been a little bit of a risk taker since I was very little. I remember when I was a little bit older than what you see in this picture, I would go to this amusement park in Denver with my family called Elitch Gardens. We went every year for a while, and I wanted so badly to ride this big, historic wooden roller coaster. You know, I looked at it kind of longingly every year that we went, and finally, one day, I was tall enough to ride it, and the attendant let me in the line. I was so excited about this, I'm sure I was really little. And as I got closer and closer to the front of the line, this thing started to look bigger and taller and scarier than it really was. And it started to sound even scarier. You could hear this rattling and rumbling from the roller coaster. I would never have admitted it at the time, but I think I was kind of terrified. But I had set my sights on this big thing. I had convinced everybody to let me do it, so I couldn't really back out at that point. So I just decided to set aside my nerves. I decided to kind of ignore them, put them aside, distract myself until I got to the front of the line and I sat down in my seat next to my dad and I pulled that lap bar down on top of me. And at that point, I was not just mentally committed to this thing, but I was physically strapped in, literally strapped in. I could not get out. So at that point, you might as well get on board and just roll with whatever is going to happen and enjoy the adventure that is coming. So I've used that a lot through my career as well. I grew up to be a mechanical engineer. I went to a place called Harvey Mudd College. It's a pretty awesome place that deserves an extra shout out. Uh, it is actually one of those places that Marian talked about that is getting to be half and half with uh, female engineers and computer scientists. But when I was graduating from Harvey Mudd, I should have gotten a professional, responsible adult engineering job, like all of my classmates did. But no, I had applied for something called a Thomas J. Watson Fellowship. And this Thomas J. Watson Fellowship, the intent of this fellowship is to take students who are really good at meeting expectations and give them the opportunity, basically pay them to run around the world studying some independent study project that they make up that might be kind of wacky and off the wall. And I, of course, proposed that I should study international influences in roller coaster design. <laughs> because aside from being a fan, I now had kind of an engineer's appreciation for the design challenges of a roller coaster. In particular, I was, and I still am, really fascinated by the interaction between the body and the machine. You know, how do your design rules change when you're no longer working with just metal and plastic, but now you actually have to design for and around the human body that grows and moves and changes and feels and breathes and thinks? Um, how do you do that? When you add that human being into the equation, it kind of changes everything. It changes the whole picture. So maybe it was my nostalgic stories about Elitch Gardens, but I somehow convinced this fellowship committee to pay me money to travel around the world riding roller coasters. <laughs> that sounds like a pretty sweet deal. I realize that that sounds outrageously cool, and it was, trust me. But it was another one of these things that got even more terrifying as I got closer to it. Right, not only was I going to be outside of the United States traveling by myself for a whole year with basically no support, but on top of that, they take all these students who are good at meeting expectations and pitch them into an area where there are no expectations. And that was as scary to me as the travel was. But again, I had set my sights on this big thing. I had talked somebody into letting me do it. So you can't really back out at that point. So I got on the plane, I strapped myself in, and I ran off around the world to study roller coaster design. Mostly that meant that I was traveling for a year with a backpack and dreadlocks. But by the end of this year, I had circumnavigated the globe. I had ridden a lot of roller coasters, despite what you see in the pictures. I had built up this confidence that you could drop me basically anywhere in the world in anywhere, any situation, and I might not know the answer. In fact, I probably wouldn't know the answer. But I had the confidence that I would be fine because I would figure it out. I trust my own ability to adapt and sort out whatever it is that I land in. I also had realized by the end of this year that 
the only expectations of me that matter are mine. And that's an important one. Right? I didn't need somebody else to define for me what it looked like to do a good job. I can do that for myself, and I should do that for myself. Also, by the end of this year, I had actually realized that I didn't want to go into roller coaster design as a career. Uh, but I'm still fascinated by the interaction between the body and the machine. So instead of putting the body in the machine, let's flip that on its head and put the machine inside of the body. So I ended up going back to grad school. I got a PhD in biomedical engineering from USC. And as part of my dissertation work, I worked on this retinal prosthesis device. This takes an image from the patient's eyeglasses and it sends it through a couple of different processing steps and eventually applies it as a spatially distributed pattern of electrical stimulation directly on the patient's retina at the back of the eye. That gives these patients artificial vision for people who have certain types of blindness. So that's a pretty amazing thing. This was a huge team that did this, and this is you know, a huge feat of engineering. But the pieces that really hit home for me were the stories that our subjects would tell about how this impacted their daily lives. To be able to see something again, anything again. Um, how much this meant to their lives. There was one patient in particular who I remember talking about how he, his granddaughter had been born after he went blind. And of course he had talked to her and interacted with her and he could hug her, uh, but he had never seen her. And this amazing feat of engineering, when he was able to take it home for the first time, he was able to take the glasses portion of it home, he was able to see his granddaughter's face for the first time ever. So that's pretty cool. Again, you add that human being into the equation and it, it changes everything. Now, I did eventually grow up and get a real professional adult engineering job. Uh, I actually did a couple jobs in a row where I was working on different medical devices and different types, different parts of the body. Um, but I ended up running product development at this small company that was making cannulas and catheters and really complex medical tubing that goes into different types of surgeries. So this particular cannula is a really good example of the types of things that we worked on. This cannula takes deoxygenated blood from the inferior and superior vena cava. Those are the two big veins that take all of the blood from your body and pump it back into your heart. So it takes that deoxygenated blood and pumps it out, and then simultaneously through the same tube and the same incision, pumps back in oxygenated blood and spits that back out into your heart. That again is a pretty complicated thing to figure out how to do, and it's a super complicated thing to manufacture. We ran a manufacturing plant that made this, and uh, there were plenty of challenges with that. But this allows hospitals to take patients whose lungs don't work anymore and keep them alive for weeks on end sometimes while they figure out how to fix their lungs. So I was at this company when what was then a division of Google X and is now Verily Life Sciences came calling and wanted to talk to me. And to be perfectly honest, I wasn't actually sure that I wanted to take the job. I really enjoyed my life in Southern California. I was living in Long Beach. I also was on this very traditional mid-device career path. I knew exactly where my career was going. I knew exactly what promotion I would get next. I wasn't sure that I wanted to flip that all on its head. And also, I didn't have any idea that any division of Google was doing anything remotely related to medical devices. To be perfectly honest, this is kind of all that I knew about Silicon Valley. <laughs> but true to form, right, I decided to get on the ride. And I am so glad that I did. I've been at Verily now for two years. Our mission is to really take the world's health organization and organize it, make it accessible, so that we can use that to help improve patients' lives. That's a pretty big, lofty goal. It's a little hard to understand, hard to visualize what that might look like. But in the near term, that means we've got a lot of concrete hardware projects uh, and science and uh, clinical projects as well. We've got a lot of concrete projects that are moving that are going to help us build either investigational tools or help us uh, interact in some patient's life in a positive way, maybe in some uh, more specific targeted way. And this glucose monitoring contact lens is a really good example of the types of things that we work on. If you imagine how this thing is built, we take a little microelectronics ring that might have an antenna on it. It uh, would have some sort of energy storage, whether that's a capacitor or a battery. Uh, a definitely a custom-designed chip. 
And then you sandwich that between layers to make it into a functional contact lens. Now, I want you to think about the team of people that it takes to do something like this. You might need an electrical engineer, you might need a chip designer, an antenna engineer, you definitely need a mechanical engineer, probably a polymer chemist, you might need a biochemist, you definitely need a couple people working on the glucose sensor, you might need a process engineer to scale it up, you might need a quality team, you probably need a regulatory specialist who can help talk to the FDA. There are a lot of functions that go into this, and I'll let you in on a little secret. I am not an expert in all of those things. Nobody could be, right? But as the technical lead, it's my job to not only bring all those functions to the table, but make sure that we're talking to each other. Make sure that we're speaking the same language, that we're all pulling in the same direction and working together towards a common end goal. So that requires of each of us, myself included, that we are not only confident and competent in the areas that we own, but that we're not afraid to say we don't know certain areas of the project. I have to get into areas of the project all the, day, all the time that are things that I don't really know that well, but I have to learn and I have to adapt as I go. All of us need to be willing to be the beginner in the room on these topics that we're not familiar with. So this picture is a really good example of that. This is some of my team from about six weeks ago. And what you see in this picture is an antenna engineer, a material scientist, a mechanical engineer, and an applied physicist, all learning to do eye surgery for the first time. I ask my team to stretch like this every day, right? And I also continue to take risks and put myself in situations that are outside of my comfort zone, outside of my core competency perhaps, uh, things that are a little nerve-wracking, maybe even a little scary. But I continue to do that because I think that that's how great things happen. Now, I am wholeheartedly on board with wherever this ride is taking me, and I am definitely committed to continuing to take risks and do things that I find to be scary, you know, all the way until I'm old and gray. But I wanted to encourage all of you guys to do the same thing. Take risks, set your sights on something big, talk somebody into letting you do it, and then strap yourself in so that you can't get out. And at that point, you have to just be on board and enjoy the adventure and see where it takes you. But thank you.